Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, coming by. Um, six o'clock Wednesday. It's uh, the last session of the, the day, I think, uh, from the Middlesex team, I believe. Um, Kate and I are here specifically going to be talking to you about uh, the product design um, programmes at um, Middlesex University. I introduce myself. I'm Professor Brendan Walker. I'm Professor of Creative Industries at Middlesex University. Um, my work is primarily uh, outside the university. I work as a product designer, a design engineer, and uh, my role is to get students and staff and researchers in the university involved in uh, in industry work outside the university and also to bring people in from the uh, industry out to work with everybody inside the university. Um, so if you come, uh, you will be meeting me at some point because I do run some uh, courses um, in the product design uh, programme. Um, and after I've spoken, um, um, we're gonna, I'm going to hand over to Kate Hurd who's the uh, programme leader, a uh, senior tutor at, um, at Middlesex University, and she'll delve more into the, the life of uh, being a student uh, on, on the uh, product design courses, what it's like, what you can expect, some of the information about those, and then we'll be finishing up with some uh, questions and answers. So you may see um, on the bottom of your screen, hopefully, uh, a Q&A panel, a little button down the bottom there. If you click in there, you can actually write your uh, messages, text in. And as I say, uh, after Kate's spoken, we'll delve in and start answering some of those Q&As. So anything you think of during this next uh, half hour to 45 minutes, just write it in there and we will address it. Um, so um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen and uh, let's see if we can do this. Um, excuse me. I'm going to click on share screen here. Share that one there. And I'm going to start by presenting some work. It's seamless, isn't it? Technology. There <laughs> we go. Whiz it back. Now, we thought we'd start with um, maybe around half an hour, I'll tell you a little bit about my work as a product designer. Um, I've been, um, I was originally trained as a, an aeronautical engineer and uh, British aerospace. Um, and I went on to be trained, retrained in industrial design and product design. And so we're just gonna give you a brief um, look at my trajectory as a career during and just post university all the way through up to where I am now the kind of projects as a product designer you can expect to get involved in um, now um, as I say I was originally trained as a, an aeronautical engineer I originally wanted to design aircraft that was my uh, passion my interests um, but as you'll probably see all the way through my, uh, th these projects I'm gonna show you, um, I've done some unusual things, um, including being a presenter on Channel 4. This was a series for Ch uh, Channel 4's uh, We Built Titanic. Uh, they wanted design engineers to help them rebuild portions of Titanic. Um, so your skills as a product designer can take you so many places um, into, theatre, TV, um, uh, industrial design, um, all the way through to working in what you might perceive to be more traditional product design uh, studios. In fact, um, that's where I started after I graduated from the Royal College of Art. This was a product uh, that I created when I was working for a design studio uh, called Design Stream. Um, they had a client called Sekisui who were creating, um, designing pet products. And as a junior designer, uh, they asked me to design um, a cage for dogs. So this was at the time injection molded, um, but these were the kind of um, drawings and renders I was producing for 
the design, very small design studio in South London at the time. This was about just over 20 years ago. See a mixture of drawing styles here, some renders and these little um, sort of hand-drawn sketches of people using the, the products. Um, and we also did quite fun things. So this was a Tamagotchi. Uh, your parents may remember these. Uh, they were digital toys, uh, but this was one was uh, designed, it was a proposal for a, uh, a toy called Aquasave to save water, um, to help people at home save water. You'd put the, uh, this device on a tap, uh, the more water you used, the lower the water level went in this little uh, game pod. And so the, the idea was to use less water and the fish would survive and multiply inside this little device. We won a design award for that in Japan. Um, I've also worked as a more traditional product designer for a company called Trantec, who got bought out by another Japanese company called Toa. And I have designed uh, radio microphones for, uh, for entertainment and performance. The one on the left here was a concept for a, a series of microphones which were inspired by uh, Las Vegas and, and Elvis. Uh, these were used on top of the pops. Uh, again, a music program from back in the, uh, probably I think the last time it was broadcast was about 10 years ago. But you see the kind of um, drawings uh, that we would do, not only the nice visual outer casings of the product, but also looking at, um, starting to look at the engineering and how these products would be fabricated and pieced together. So these drawings, these circles at the bottom are showing some cutaway, some sections uh, through these products. So not only do they have to look great, but they all have to function and also have to be able to be manufactured as well. And these were some uh, of the, the direct renders we were producing uh, using 3D modeling uh, for, uh, for Toa of this particular product range. And we designed about, I think about 40 different um, uh, proposals for Toa for different radio microphone combinations. There are a mixture of belt packs, transmitters and handheld microphones. Um, I then actually, um, one of the product design companies I worked with was a company called Hollington's who made, uh, designed um, Parker pens, Kodak cameras, um, they worked for Herman Miller, so a very classic product design company, but they um, were asked by the Science Museum to design new exhibits for the museum. Now, as a product designer, I was incredibly well placed to not only to help the architects who were um, designing the interiors of these um, museums, but also to start designing some of the exhibits. So here you'll see, I mean, in a museum, a classic museum environment. So I say this was the welcome wing. This was uh, called uh, the Who Am I gallery at the time. Um, I was designing bespoke buttons for interactive um, installations, um, designing inserts into these very amorphous looking, um, uh, well, they were called bloids, these um, structures here, uh, who another furniture designer in our studio is designing. But also I started um, designing um, some electromechanical installations. So I took my skills as an engineer and was designing mechanical installations for museums. Um, so the one on the left was called Chips Inside. The, this conveyor belt rotated round and the visitor had to stop the conveyor belt when they thought there was an electronic chip inside. And you can't see on the backside of the um, installation, there was a, an X-ray machine, which then looked inside the, the product to see whether it did contain chips or not. And the one on the right hand side was called DigiDots. And this was an electromechanical display, which was taking photographs of users and turning them into uh, digital uh, dot displays, uh, very much like the displays that they used to use at Wit in Wimbledon for their scores. Um, so I really started to explore more to do with sort of mechanical engineering and digital technology and how that uh, could be used with uh, product design skills to create these new installations for museums. 
I've also um, used my skills as a product designer to create uh, unusual products. Um, so this one here um, was a project that I did for the Wellcome Trust, which is a, uh, a biomedical um, charity in London. Um, I, the, the project was actually looking at uh, creating a, a, a camera which could be worn on fairground rides and would take photographs of riders uh, at their peak moments of excitement. You can probably see on this guy's hand, it's actually me, uh, these little sensors on his fingers. And when you get very excited, you, your hands become sweaty. And that was triggering, triggering a camera to take photographs. Now, this was all created, even though the, the, it's not a very classic product, this was all created and designed and the, the whole iteration of the design process followed a very uh, well uh, trodden path that a product designer would take in development. And these photographs, in fact, they're still being exhibited now about 15 years later, were main, mainly intended for art galleries. So these photographs um, were supposed to evoke different types of emotions in the viewer. Uh, so there's a whole selection of things. So that's very much at the at the arts end of the spectrum. But even though it's at the arts end of the spectrum, still using quite rigorous uh, design processes. Another area of work uh, that I've applied my design skills is in the design of um, amusement park rides. Uh, I run as part of, part of one of my businesses. I run an organisation called Thrill Laboratory. Uh, where I work with artists, designers, engineers, performers, all who, who have an interest in designing uh, thrilling emotional experiences. And I've worked with Merlin Entertainment, who used to be the, the, um, uh, the Two Swords group, uh, to design, I've helped to design uh, roller coasters. Uh, and again, it's a very different uh, type of product, but it is nonetheless a very large product, uh, just as an aircraft is. Um, so I've worked on the, uh, the design concepts for Wickham and at Alton Towers. I'm sure lots of you have been on that. And also a very specific ride feature on 13, also at Alton Towers, where I um, designed the, the drop feature uh, for that particular ride, because you need to know not only about um, uh, how to design, so the, the physical aspects of design, but also uh, human factors and how bodies respond to, to entertainment. So um, one of my fascinations with design is, is thinking about psychology. Uh, that's a really big part of, of, of human factors. And how long does it take to drop somebody in the dark before uh, for them to be excited? And it turns out it's 0.7 seconds. And from that, you can calculate how far you need to drop somebody. And then lots of the other parts of the, um, the roller coaster design fall out from that. So, you know, it's a blend for me. Uh, design isn't just about form. It's also about understanding the users and particularly a, a, somewhere like a theme park where user experience, people pay for it. It's, um, it's, it's a very interesting aspect of design. I also apply my skills as a designer in, uh, in TV and making props, not only appearing on TV, but actually making things for TV shows. Uh, I was asked by It's Not Rocket Science, uh, a popular Saturday night science TV show, um, if I could design the world's first inverting playground slide. Um, now, um, I won't go into the science and engineering of this, but again, uh, I used a, a process of um, a design process to create this slide. What it had to do was uh, for, a, for a rider to go from the top all the way around the, the loop without dropping out and smashing themselves, <laughs> causing harm in the loop. Anyway, I'll show you um, if it worked or not. Let's give it a go. <laughs> so there you go. There's, I do a whole talk on the design of that particular ride. But you can see the, the, the areas you can get into. And um, the next um, image, um, video I'm going to show you is just some work we've done for Blue Peter and the BBC. So testing people on rides. So we've developed 
those kind of techniques for taking photographs of people now we're using those techniques to video people on rides to monitor their heart rate and we're now working with uh, tv production companies designing uh, graphics for tv to show well i'll show you this example which was from about i'm trying to think now this was about nine years ago <laughs> As we're coming back in now to the loading bay, you can see his levels of stress, his sweat levels are still incredibly high. He's still very excited. And he absolutely loved this ride. Not bad on it, Brennan. There you go. I do I do love a little bit of candy floss. Um now. As far as uh, Middlesex University goes and, and the kind of projects as students you may be able to get involved in, um, I'll quite often bring projects from outside into the university. And this was uh, a really good example of this, where I worked with some recent graduates, uh, design graduates uh, from the university. Ella's Kitchen asked me if I could design a machine that would monitor um, babies' levels of excitement at tasting different types of food. And so I propose, this is actually the final image that got used in some online adverts. Um, it was a thrillometer for babies using a very similar technique to the one I showed you taking photographs, though in, we're monitoring baby's feet here. Uh, the baby's sweat levels are going into the machine and when they eat different food types, um, the, their levels of excitement get registered on this big dial. But the kinds of, um, uh, techniques we were using, if you have a look on the left hand side, it was all very much to do with using um, prototyping uh, methods. So sometimes you can create great uh, effects, such as this, this, Im this image here on the right, which looks like a product, but the process you use it uh, to create it can actually be quite simple. So these were actually made in the workshop quite simply and they're much more like uh, designing theatre props uh, than fully finalised medical piece of equipment. So there's always, you know, we always look at and examine the design requirements of clients to understand what they need, because in this one, uh, all that was required was a, uh, a product that could work for camera and also could be shot and filmed very well. It didn't matter what the bat looked like. Um, and another type of um, product that I got involved in, another project that I brought to the university, um, was a project that I was doing for uh, Thorpe Park. They asked me to design an installation for one of their bedrooms for a hotel that they were uh, proposing, which became Shark Hotel at Thorpe Park. I was kind of interested in the way uh, when people sleep and they go into deep REM sleep, um, you can actually influence people's sleep. And if you can detect when somebody's sleeping, then you can start to do some interesting things with them. And I, my proposal was, well, if somebody's been on a roller coaster at uh, Thorpe Park during the day, and then they go to bed at night, maybe if we move their bed in a very subtle way that matches the kind of rides that they've been on during, during the day, maybe we can make people in the hotel dream about the rides they've been on during the day. So they're actually getting a second go at going on the rides. And uh, Thorpe Park loved it. Um, and I came to uh, my colleagues at Middlesex University and said, well, this is a kind of rough sketch of uh, what we want to make. Uh, it's a bed, it's got four actuators. So actuators are little motors that you can control to move things around. You'll find all sorts of devices at home have got actuators in to move things. Um, and if we can um, control the bed and the angle, we could probably start to script it. We could create a program language that would move the bed and recreate those kinds of movements that we would have on the ride. Now, we didn't stop there. In fact, this bed is still yet to be made, but we made an early prototype. Um, now this particular chair uh, was designed in-house at Middlesex University. It's a motion platform. It uses um, air muscles. So you can probably see this chair is suspended by four 
uh, sorry, six, uh, what we call air muscles. These are like the, these uh, triangular formed uh, suspension points. And when they get filled with air, they shorten. And so you can actually uh, control, well, I'll show you here. Um, this is uh, modeled using a program called Raptor. And this was actually by um, uh, a graduate who uh, had been uh, heavily involved in robotics. So another aspect of design that's a possibility. But the great thing about Middlesex University is if you're on a course, there are so many other courses going on around you. So if you're not an expert at robotics, you can always talk to people who are. But anyway, on this particular project, you can see that, uh, well, it's a classic uh, kind of roller coaster simulator. And we released the plans for this, the design schematics, uh, which has allowed secondary school pupils around the UK to make their own versions of this. This was our intention to not only uh, to not only to create something I could use in my work, but to create a project that was so simple to fabricate. 16-year-olds could make it with their, uh, with their teachers in workshops at schools around the UK. So these were the, the design plans for that. My interest in that ride, though, uh, went off on a slight tangent. Uh, I've been working um, with some neurologists looking at um, devices for brain monitoring. And I was asked in 2015 whether I could uh, create the world's first brain controlled thrill ride. The idea was, and obviously you can see it uses virtual reality. The idea was that we we're gonna monitor people's brains, gonna take all that data. We're gonna create a virtual world that you could fly through and people would sit on board the, this chair that had been designed at Middlesex University and you go for a flight through your own brain data in real time. I'll show you a quick video of how that went. Now, th there was a massive team involved in producing that. Um, so this project was very much about collaboration. We had people from the um, computer graphics um, department in, at the Middlesex University helping to design the, um, the virtual world uh, that we're flying through. Uh, we obviously had the uh, product designers and design engineers uh, working on the chair and the control systems for the chair. Um, I had other scientists from the University of Nottingham working on brain monitoring. Uh, we had musicians as well um, who were creating music based on the data. So it was one of those projects where it wasn't, again, it was, um, there were lots of different people from very different creative uh, disciplines all coming together to realize this big project. It was very much about how all those different disciplines work together. And this image here you can see is a, uh, a page out of my, my own sketchbook, uh, which starts to show how I was piecing together the projects and how those different teams would work together. But these, this kind of project management is the kind of thing as a designer, you become very used to being able to piece together because you're, you're not a specialist in any one area, but you have a great appreciation of seeing this overview. And this is where a lot of creative work can go. So you'll finish uh, your time at Middlesex University being able to plan your own projects in similar kind of detail. And of course, we have great fun taking the, uh, the motion platform to, uh, to various uh, expos and exhibitions where as students, uh, you'll be invited to have the opportunity to actually man some of these um, uh, installations. This is at New Scientist Live um, in London. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Well, that's a very brief, <laughs> a very brief uh, introduction to that. Uh, my own work right now, and I'm just going to maybe the last five minutes, I'm uh, going to whiz through some uh, work I'm doing at the moment. Uh, my interest in virtual reality continued, and that's where a lot of my work now as a designer uh, lies. Um, I became interested in the how we could um, add virtual reality experiences to existing um, rides, such as a playground swing. Um, I'm always inspired by very old um, accounts of rides or old patents that I can find. In fact, the image you see here on the right was for a design of a ride that appeared in 1894, I think it was, uh, and made an appearance at the Chicago's World Fair. It's a haunted swing. And if anybody's been on Hex at Alton Towers, you'll know what it is. You swing backwards and forwards in reality, back and forth. But the room, you don't realise, is also on a on a, a, a hinge bearing and will rotate in the opposite direction. And the effect is you feel like you're doing a full loop the loop when in fact you're only going swinging forwards and backwards a little bit. And I thought, well, I wonder if we can do that with virtual reality. If we can use the sensors on board uh, a VR headset, maybe we can use those to, um, to transform a virtual view of a space. And this was actually, a gallery in, in Sheffield and very slowly we could just make the room rotate a little bit further than it actually should be going until people feel like they're doing a full loop the loop and people did start screaming which was great. Um, now my own work just going back to my sketchbook this is the kind of um, drawings that I do because my background's engineering but also you see um, I often use pictures of, of people's facial expressions. In fact, they're my own in this image here, um, where I'm trying to work out how to control people's uh, use of uh, my worlds, or how do I design my worlds to elicit these different types of responses, whether it's making people feel scared or excited. Uh, no, so it's, it's, you know, if we were to boil it right down into its in bare components is how are people engaging with this product or service over time? Um, how are we going to be affecting people's emotions over that time? Is there joy? Is there delight? And when I get involved in projects with students at the university, they're very much um, the kind of projects I'll be running with you. A lot about emotional engagement with pro products, not just their form and function, even though they do contribute very heavily to how people respond uh, in their use of those piece of equipment. But then there's also great fun things like uh, this was a drawing going, well, what could I do with those types of movements uh, on a swing? This was an idea that if I could make people swing, maybe I could make them feel that they were riding on top of an elephant. So this is more the kind of work that I would do with theme parks. I even get involved in designing swings. So these, uh, I designed these uh, swings which have been touring around uh, the UK, Europe, uh, South Korea, uh, North America, um, and currently have a set now in Australia, which just opened. So, you know, again, it's play equipment. And I've just uh, finished a project uh, with second years in product design. Uh, designing play equipment which is accessible for uh, people with uh, different access needs um, and you know so the, the, so play equipment in this scale of um, uh, product design is something um, I also uh, work with students on at the university but my own work obviously um, I'll put VR on it and this uh, particular project as I say has been touring for several years now and this one was called VR Playground and on it well I just uh, make this a bit quieter. Uh, these were just three of the experiences you could actually uh, try with your VR headset. So um, I would make people feel as though they were rolling forwards or walking uh, like a giant through a city or bouncing like doing parkour over rooftops. Um, and this is another playground swinger designed for uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. And this one was inspired by Leonardo da Vinci's flying machines. So you could put on a headset and feel as though you're flying inside Leonardo da Vinci glider 
or the helical screw, the ornithopter, the parachute. But everything about this, uh, those experiences, just going back to this, uh, this swing, um, you know, that every aspect of this has been carefully designed, whether it's using engineering and design or whether it's using graphic design, but also working with animators as well uh, to design these worlds. And even down to the, the costumes of the operators who were running these uh, experiences, the costumes, uh, how we do the branding of this, the visual communication are all things that my studio uh, gets in, involved in. So very much down to the, that level of detail. And again, some more drawings from out of our sketchbooks. These are the kind of things we'll, we'll be looking at on the course, how to just use some very basic uh, drawing skills, how you can actually start to develop design thinking, design concepts. So this was for that particular uh, swing, which was, if I just go back to it, which was uh, around the tree. It was cantilevered from the tree. So it basically leant out from the tree. And I was trying to work out different ways we might do that. So I moved from sketchbook drawings through to the use of lollipop sticks, sellotape and string to try and uh, see if it looked uh, like it would actually take the weight. Uh, then move from that to make a very small model out of uh, bamboo sticks and string. And then we made a, a one quarter scale model uh, using um, uh, copper piping. And then all the way through to a, a half scale model, which uh, we tested in a, um, in a park in uh, East Ham in uh, East London. Um, and then all the way through to then prototyping at my workshop in, e in East London uh, in Hackney. Uh, this was the first time we made the swing. So you see there's a, a product development cycle uh, involved. Um, and the same goes with the different experiences. Again, this is out of my sketchbook. Uh, you see my sketching isn't the world's best, but I use it intensively to actually develop uh, my thinking. It's always about developing your thinking and then uh, finally being able to communicate your ideas to other people. And finally, because we're just on about half hour, uh, the final ride I'm working on, which you can all try out, um, it's currently open on Brighton Palace Pier. Uh, anybody who knows the pier, if you go to the end of Brighton Pier, there's a ride called the Twister, um, which is down there. In fact, the Twister celebrated its 80th anniversary this year. It was designed by um, uh, a guy uh, in, in America um, called uh, Richard Harris. And it's a ride that does sort of circles within circles, um, describing these um, very pretty shapes you can see here. In fact, the top right hand one that's moving, you can see that how uh, the riders moves around this particular ride. But I've been making virtual reality experiences for this ride. And if you go to the pier, you can hire one of our headsets and get on this ride. And uh, well, this is what you'll experience. <laughs> Now, that last project, I'll just leave you with a final thought. Um, all the, my studio, design studio, handled everything from the design of the uniforms, 
uh, the design of the sales kiosk and the branding, the safety devices that are used on those headsets. You probably saw those lanyards that clipped onto the ride. All those had to be inspected by the health and inspe uh, safety uh, inspectorates. Um, and then that was even before we could get onto the really fun bit, which was designing the VR worlds that people had experienced on that ride. And it's only because of my training in product design uh, that I was able to apply my skills to all those areas of design and pull together that entire project. So um, I think uh, that's enough from me. Um, you, you know, very welcome to take questions about that towards the end, but I think it's a good time to hand over, uh, stop sharing my screen and hand over to Kate Hurd, to the, uh, the programme leader. Is that work for you, Kate? It does, thanks, Brendan. It's always really exciting to see your presentations and you get that kind of reminder of what product design is about and why we do it. <laughs> which is always good. Um, and it, it makes me think that so many people have a misunderstanding of what a product design degree actually means. And this, this kind of misconception that it's, it's a very creative degree, you can't do anything really with it in the real world, um, that it's just about designing furniture and all of those things. Um, whereas what we're actually doing is training people to be curious, to be great communicators, to be problem solvers. And as in some of the examples you were showing, you kind of become a facilitator in a team, don't you, a multidisciplinary team where you're able to speak the language of all of those people without needing to know all of the details yourself. You, you become the conduit through which the projects can run. Um, so I think it's really useful to think about product design in that way. And then the breadth of careers and opportunities that lie ahead as you go out into industry. So it's not just the pretty bit that gets tacked on the end of a process. As a product designer, you become fundamental to, to everything within the creative process. So a little bit of an overview of the programs that we run here at Middlesex. So my name's Kate, I'm program leader for the BA Product Design Program and BNG Product Design Engineering. Um, when I'm not program leader, I'm also associate director of Red Loop, which is the University Design and Innovation Center. Um, so there's a lot of creative stuff happening in Middlesex, so lots and lots of opportunities of real world work and things to come and get involved in. So a little bit of an overview just about the program. Um, so we run the two programmes. The BA at the moment is accredited by the Institute of Engineering Designers, and we're currently going through accreditation for the BNG programme. Um, it's a three year programme with an optional placement year, and we encourage all of our students where possible to take that placement year. Um, some of the things that make us different from some of the other universities is that we have a shared year, first year between the BA and the BNG programme, because we often find that when people are applying, they don't really know which course is going to be right for them. So by having that shared first year, it allows you to have an understanding of the, the courses themselves, but also what kind of design you want to go and be at the end. Um, and so early in year two, you're able to switch between those programs to get the thing that's really right for you. Another thing that makes us really different from other programs is our small cohorts. So we aim for kind of 20 to 25 students per year group. Um, again, very different from some other institutions where you'd be looking at kind of 100 to 150 per year group potentially. And what that means is we can actually work together with the design team. You get to know all the members of staff, you get to know every student within your year group and every student within the other year groups as well. So we have this really great community feel and it allows us um, to provide excellent pastoral care as well within the programme. All of our staff who teach on the programme have industry experience. So other people like Brendan who are actively working out in industry at the moment who come and contribute to the programme, but every single member of staff is also actively involved um, in outside work um, through things like Red Loop, the University Innovation Centre. So again, what that allows us to do is keep really well connected with what's actually happening in industry and to give you really great experiences. We have a really active alumni network, so these are graduates of our programme. So we do that primarily through a LinkedIn group um, where we have, I think, around 150 graduates at the moment. So we have a portal where people can stay connected, where we can share job opportunities. And we find that alumni often share job opportunities with each other and with current students who are graduating. So again, we've got this, um, this community feel that extends beyond the programme and out into your professional life. Again, a really valuable thing to have. Um, something that was really important to us on the programme is, is this kind of ethos of collaboration and not competition. And so by coming on the programme, we're not looking for only notionally the best students, but we're looking for um, an environment and experience which will allow everybody to grow and do the best that they can. It doesn't mean that we're not very good at competitions and we find that lots of our students actually go away and win design awards because of the great process that we have and the learning experience that we have here. As a student of Middlesex, you also have a personal tutor assigned to you. Um, and we very strongly believe that that will be um, 
uh, something that's really important to us is that we find those within the, the product design program themselves. So you'll have a dedicated member of staff who's there with you throughout your journey to university, um, who's your kind of go-to point. We have exceptional workshop facilities. Um, if anyone's around on Saturday, the 11th of June, I think it is, we have um, an open day running on campus. So again, go to the university website, you can book, you can come and meet someone from the teaching team and have a look around the facilities. Now, as a product design student, once you've gone through your initial health and safety training, all of those facilities are available to you. So there's no restrictions on those. Again, something different from many other programs around the country. As a student, you're given a license for the key bits of software that you'll need. So things like SolidWorks for our 3D modeling um, and the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite. So um, access isn't just restricted to university, you can download it onto your own machines at home. We have a dedicated studio space for all of our teaching. So our product design students have a home on campus. We have free printing, this is kind of sales speak for the university, free printing, but we also provide all of our project materials at no extra cost to students. And that includes things like 3D printing, because again, you're investing huge amounts of money and time in the course, and we don't want your development to be restricted by your access to personal finance. So it's really important to us to provide the level playing field for everybody. We also have all of our degree show costs funded by the university. So unlike many universities where, where students are asked in their final year to go and fundraise, um, we exhibit on campus, but we also exhibit at the New Designers Exhibition at the Business Design Centre in London. Again, all of those costs are covered for you. So that's the kind of upfront sales speak. Um, what does it actually mean to be a product designer at Middlesex? What do we do? What do we mean by a product design? And again, really important questions to ask if you go and look at any design course. What do they mean by product design? So for us, product design is everything from physical products to interactions to experiences to services. And we'll try and give you a taste of all of those things on the programme. The best way to find out about what a programme actually believes is product design is to look at the work of the graduates. And I can show you where you can find out some of that information in a moment. But for us, product design is about conversations. It's about conversations with material, conversations between people and conversations within society. Because we don't design in isolation, we need to have a really good understanding of what's going on in the world around us. So we talk about bringing people and technology together in meaningful ways. We design things for a reason. We design things to make a difference. And when we say technology, that can be anything from a physical product through to a digital interaction or a piece of electronics. And again, we'll train you to do all of those things. So this was created by one of our graduates a couple of years ago. He did a one second every day recording his final year at university. So it's an interesting snapshot on what it's like to be a student. <laughs> Thank you. 
get rid of him. And hopefully what it shows is that, oops, there aren't much it again. Um, it teaches you, um, it shows you what it would be like to be a student. So you won't be sitting anonymously in a lecture theatre full of hundreds of people every day, but you'll be here, you'll be part of a team, you'll be in the studio, you'll be making things yourself. It's not a course where you'll come and have things made for you. You'll learn to be part of the team, to be part of the process. And it's a really um, active, passionate environment with people who really care about you um, and people who really care about the subject. Now, as I was saying, the best way to find out about a program is to find out about the kind of work that happens there. So that gives you a little taster into one particular student experience, but you can also find out about us, for example, on our Instagram feed. So if you find us on at MDXPD, you can see a curated feed of some of our graduate work. If you have a look at the hashtag MDXPD, what you'll see is a more uncurated feed of staff and students going back over a number of years now. So again, browsing that gives you a feel of the kind of projects that happen, what the spaces look like and the kind of people that, that, are, that make up the program. So again, another way to come and find us. You can also have a look at the MBXPD magazine. So this we publish every single year and they're available as back copies online as well. And we have things like staff and student profiles. We have um, a page for every single piece of graduate work on the program. So again, it's a really good way to get an insight into the kind of experiences and the kind of projects that you would study during your time with us at Middlesex. Now I'm conscious that it's already 10 to seven. So I'm gonna skim through just a couple of slides. Um, and again, feel free to get in touch with me after the talk um, if there's any other questions that you'd like answered. So the kind of projects that you might do, so a glance at some of our graduate work. Um, this was a project by a student called Ralph who did Rush. He was really interested in interesting ways of gathering new data. So he was a cyclist himself. He was looking at um, systems like Strava that many cyclists use to track their journeys. But he was saying, what if you do alternative types of cycling? So he was looking at, um, again, developing working prototypes to gather um, slightly less traditional data. So if you're doing off-road BMX racing, for example, how can you track your routes and um, create memorable, shareable pieces of data about your experience? Uh, we had a student called Hugh who was really interested um, after a family experience in skin cancer and how that's detected and the kind of patient care that happens between diagnosis through to treatment. So Hugh developed a working prototype of a, a skin cancer detection device right through to a full set of design for manufactured drawings of how the product could work and be produced. And then completely different project. We had Nav who was a design activist, really interested in the environment and was looking at um, everyday products, thinking about how they could be reconceptualized, not just in terms of how the product is made, but how the entire system and service around those products can be made. So she was looking at um, the throwaway nature of irons, household irons, and how that could be redesigned into a modular product where as it started to go wrong, you could replace individual components rather than the whole product itself. Um, so again, a whole spectrum of projects um, and directions are possible. We run large projects with students. So throughout the first, second and third year, we try and get, as Brenda was saying, industry involved in the program itself. 
we'll teach you how to present your work, we'll teach you how to work with the client, we'll teach you how to read a brief. Um, and again, it builds your network, it builds you a really strong portfolio um, for when you exit the programme. We have um, an industry guest lecture series, which happens every single week throughout the teaching year. So again, providing you access to a wide range of industry professionals um, and building your network. So the idea is not when you graduate, you start to build a network and become a product designer, but from day one, when you enter the programme, will be um, allowing you to make connections, helping you to build your online profile and your confidence and understanding of what the industry actually means. As we said earlier, our alumni are incredibly important to us and we find our graduates all over the world doing a whole range of different types of jobs. And again, if you have a look through the MDXPD magazine, we do many showcases on where our graduates are now. But we've got graduates in everything from standard kind of product design consultancy jobs through to uh, crowdfunding experts, graphic designers, teachers, product design engineers, a whole, a whole spectrum. So again, what we're doing is, is providing you with a skill set which is adaptable um, and relatable to a range of different industry disciplines. If you have a look at the magazines, we've done a couple of showcases kind of looking back five, 10 years on, where are they now? So again, some really great stories about where our designers are. And we've had students um, at Lego, we've had students at Dyson, we've had students at Tesla, a whole range of different companies all around the world um, doing amazing things. Thank you very much. I'm gonna end there, see if you've got any questions. If you want to screenshot that, it'll tell you how to find the Instagram feed and the magazines. Um, you can find my email address there, or if you go to the university website, um, you can find me on the program pages. So a bit of a, a skim through at the end. I'm gonna stop sharing to see if we've got any questions. We've got a few minutes left. That was brilliant, Kate. There was so many um, projects <laughs> there I wasn't even aware of. A bit of a uh, rush. And there's so many things to talk about. It's always hard to know which examples to pick out. But that's why yeah. the magazines are so great, because it allows people to, to browse and get a really interested, interesting kind of feel of what the programme is all about. Yeah. And I think I saw um, Swifty Scooters. I mean, this is the nice thing about the design community as well that you see people popping up that you know from somewhere else. It's a very, I think it's unlike any other community of, of practitioners, that there's a really healthy international community. So you will find people popping up that you know, and people do tend to move between studios. And like even Swifty Scooters, I know Jason, I used to teach him at, uh, at uh, the RCA. So people do keep popping up around, which is one of Absolutely. the nice things. Yeah, yeah. Jason, with, Jason was with us beforehand. Oh, was he? Yeah, okay. so we came from Middlesex, yeah. Well, I did, I had no idea. <laughs> How fantastic. Yeah, it was lovely. Um, yeah, well, we've got no questions at the moment. Um, so the open for anyone. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what kind of skill set do you look for in a prospective student and do you require like a, a portfolio? Very good question. Um, so yes, so at the moment we have an interview process on campus. Um, quite different from many other institutions where you maybe will have a kind of one-to-one -one interview with a member of staff who will ask you about your favorite designer. We do things slightly differently because what we want to do is give people a taste of the way that we actually teach. Um, so we'll do an interview activity on campus. We'll ask people to come with a portfolio um, and we generally do an activity around the portfolios. Now portfolios, people get really nervous about putting those together and we're gonna be producing some assets this year to help guide people a little bit further next year. Um, but essentially it's a demonstration of your skill set at that point. That might be activities that you've done in school or college and kind of projects, or it might be personal things if you don't have the kind of traditional background to get onto the program. Um, but essentially what we're looking for is, is not the best students in terms of, have you done CAD, are you an expert at drawing? Have you got some really high quality projects in your portfolio? But we're looking for potential in people. We're looking for, um, for a passion in the subject, a kind of a curiosity and a willingness to get involved and try stuff out. And for us, that's why the interview is kind of equally as important as the portfolio, because if you've not gone through a traditional educational route that, that gives you those assets already, um, we can get to know you as a person and see the kind of people that are going to be a good fit for the programme. So I would, I would never want the portfolio to be a hindrance to somebody applying for the programme. And quite often people will get in touch with me beforehand, um, and I'm more than happy always to chat to people about the kind of things that can go into a portfolio. It's a very daunting thing to do if you've never put one together before. Yeah, of course, yeah. And are there kind of subjects that you kind of recommend that they do at level three, be it A-level or B-tech or something like that? 
Or we have a whole we have a whole mix come onto the program. So so many will go through the kind of traditional routes of studying design or technology. Um, some people come only from an art background. Some people come only from an engineering background. And then occasionally we get mature students who have none of those backgrounds, but just really want to come and study the subject. Um, yeah. And again, with a few months lead up, I can talk to them about things they can do to prepare themselves for the application. Um, so always happy to speak to people um, for the no more uh, non-traditional routes. Yeah. And I think I've also found that, um, you know, I, I think it <clears throat> can be quite daunting coming into the first year thinking we've all got to conform to being, uh, you know, a product designer and this is it. Do I fit in? In fact, what you'll find out is that the things you love doing in your own time or the subjects you've studied to that point are all um, kind of like I see as being your special powers. And you'll start to interweave those with your uh, with the training you get as a product designer. So um, everybody has their own character. That's the nice thing. It, it's a mixture of very subjective and very objective kind of processes and personality. So you can, you know, come with your own creative baggage and interests and you can start to explore those and interweave them with your projects. That's part of the the fun of being part of a larger design community at the university that you do get individuals and different personalities coming out and that that's what makes it so exciting for me as a when I come to teach that you see all these students and you've all got your own you know specialisms in the things you do well um so yeah um yeah it's very pluralistic very open I think as a community Absolutely. And, and we specifically designed the first year to be accommodating for everybody's background. So the first year um, is only a pass or fail on the program, although there's extensive amounts of feedback um, given throughout the entirety of the first year. But it, it allows people to try stuff out. It allows people to come in with different backgrounds and to get everybody's skill set up to the right level to progress to year two and to year three. Um, so it's very much about unlearning lots of the things that have maybe been taught in school or college, which is not necessarily the way that the design process actually works. Um, and just allowing people to, to have fun and to experiment and to make mistakes and to learn through that process. So the first is very much focused on um, building everybody's skill set across all of the key areas. Yeah. And what would you think is the big difference between the BA product design course and the BN product design engineering course? Okay, so yeah, good question. Um, they're very similar. So there's lots of shared content between the two programs. And as I said, there's a shared first year. The way that we generally describe it is that with our focus on people and technology, for the BA students, we have a slightly greater focus on the people that the technology is designed for. And the BN is slightly more focused on how that technology works um, yes. in light of the people that we need to consider. Oh, um, right, okay. So, so quite subtle um, to the point where we'll often even find that the BA students, when they get to their final major project, will actually be doing very kind of heavy technological work. Um, yeah. so, so nothing will stop you from doing the kind of projects that you want to do, but it's just a slightly different flavor to a couple of the modules. Yeah. And again, that's the nice thing about the shared first year is it will give people a, a genuine sense of the thing that they're actually most passionate about. Exactly, yeah, it gives them the choice to choose really where, where Absolutely. they want to go, yeah. Perfect. Um, no questions from our students? None at all. None at all. Um, uh, it's seven o'clock. I think we're probably going to wrap up. Um, it's been amazing. Thanks a lot, Kate and Brendan, uh, for this kind of very inspiring talk on product design, uh, especially at Middlesex University. So thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us uh, this evening. And so that's all we have time for. So as Kate mentioned before, we have an open day on Saturday, the 11th of June. You can book on our website. And if you need kind of more information, just go to the course pages on our website, or you can meet our academics at the open day, which will be in June. So thank you, everybody. Have a good evening then. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.